distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. It is a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce our eminent speaker today, Mr. Eric Solheim, the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, also under Secretary General of the United Nations. Prior to his current position in UNEP, which he assumed in May 2016, Mr. Solheim was with the Nor Norwegian government and several international organizations focusing on environment and development. He was the chair of the DEC, Development Assistant Committee of the OECD, from 2013 to 2016. Previously, from 2007 to 2012, he held the combined portfolio of Norway minister, Ministers of the Environment and International Development. And from 2005 to 2007, he served as the Minister for International Development. In addition to his career as a minister and at OECD, Mr. Solheim has served as UNEP Special Envoy for Environment, Conflict and Disasters since 2013, and a patron of nature for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, since 2012. Today, uh, our eminent speaker, Mr. Eric Solheim, will talk about how protecting natural capital can be good for profits and for people, and the importance of private sector engagements to achieve lasting social, economic, and environmental progress. Mr. Solheim holds a degree in history and social studies from the University of Oslo. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Eric Solheim to the eminent speaker forum. try to be a little bit closer to, uh, to people. Uh, let me set out, as I see it, kind of the, the big picture of um, environment and development in an uncertain world, and then we have a conversation with counter-arguments and, and, and questions and, and answers. There seems to be a, a crazy idea dominating most of global politics as, at the moment. That crazy idea is that everything was better in the past. And in most nations, I heard people saying, oh, it was so good in the past, now it's worse, now there are problems. And the reality is, of course, exactly the opposite. We are, without any comparison, living at the most lucky moment in human history. We are the most lucky human beings that has ever been around. We should celebrate, we should drink champagne every day, every moment, uh, and have, uh, have real, real, real fun. Uh, and this, of course, I mean, we can put upon ourselves every number of fact proving this. When I was visiting India for the first time in the 1980s, there were hundreds of thousands of polio cases in India alone. Last year, zero, not one. This year, Sri Lanka, one of my favorite countries, was declared uh, malaria-free. Quite an achievement at the island, which is very wet, with a lot of rain, right in the tropics. Uh, if you go to South Korea, the average South Korean is 390 times richer. I mean, taste that figure, 390 times richer than the grandparents were in the 1950s when I was, I was born. And in the coastal province of China, people are 100 times richer, not than the grandparents were, but where the parents were when Deng Xiaoping started the reform process uh, in, in, in China. I was just back from Shanghai I was yesterday. Life expectancy in China is now 76 on average for this huge country. And in Shanghai, it's 83, which means that the life expectancy in Shanghai is now comparable to any. It may still be a little bit below Tokyo, but I'm not aware of any other city in the world which will be above 83 years of life expectancy. So change is enormous and is positive. And by the, by the way, we are not living in a, at a particularly, uh, um, particularly vo uh, volatile or particularly uh, violent time. We are living at the most peaceful of times. Uh, with the peace process in Colombia now coming to an end, there is not one armed conflict remaining at the entire American continent, from the land of fire in the south to Alaska in the north. 
and of course East Asia, where there are for sure tensions in many places here, is also by and large in complete peace. From 1945 to 1980, 80% of all war deaths on the planet was in East Asia. Since 1980, there has hardly been any war deaths in East Asia. Because the nation started to focus on development, and it was more important to develop your country than to quarrel with your neighbors, and you sorted out ma major issues, or you froze major issues. Can you think of a more wise policy than the policy of Deng Xiaoping towards Taiwan, saying that this problem is intractable, my generation will not be able to solve it, Maybe the next generation is wiser. Maybe they can find the final solution to that. But in the meantime, we keep peace. In the meantime, we, we focus on prosperity. In the meantime, we develop both Taiwan and the mainland. And then maybe at a later point, you can find a solution. Think of how useful this doctrine would be for many other conflict areas in, in the world that you just postpone solving the problem. OK. I'm given you any number of examples from your part of the world, but it's not only here. Also Africa, though not at the speed of Asia, is progressing. We have reduced malaria with 70% in Africa since the year 2000, 70%. Ethiopia alone has reduced child mortality with two third. That saves more lives in Ethiopia alone than all dying in all global wars on the entire planet Earth combined. So it's not small because they were dying one by one in cabins all over Ethiopia, not in one big splash, then Fox News and, uh, and, and the newspaper People's Daily would have uh, covered it uh, as the one and only global news. So what I mean to say is that we are enormously successful in so many areas, that is one of the most well-hidden facts for the global population, because people tend to believe that everything was much better before. If the past was another country, it was the most violent country we can ever think of. And if the past was another country, it was an enormously less prosperous country. In Indonesia, in the, as late as in the 1970s, uh, life expectancy was about 50 years. In the, four, in the 60s, it was 45. Now Indonesia is at 71. And of course, rapidly increasing on that basis also. So let's celebrate progress, but let's also analyze what gives progress, because that's, of course, what we want to do more of to look into what, what helps. I was at a conference in, in, in Washington the other day where I think Barack Obama, how much we will miss him, uh, did set the, the policies right. He said, <coughs> I mean, he, we, will, we will daily miss him for sure. He was a, he has been a brilliant president in my view. But leave that aside, that's a personal opinion. He said, my two young daughters, I think the names are Malia, Sasha, something like that. My two young daughters ha have never heard, he said, the concept, the word acid rain. If I speak about acid rain, they don't know what it's all about. Then I said, that was the defining environmental issue when I started growing into a politician and becoming interested in environment and politics. Acid rain was destroying the nature all over Western Europe and the United States and many other places as well. Why don't Sasha and Malia know about it? It's solved. It's gone. There's no acid rain anymore. As we have been able to, with the Montreal Protocol, solve the enormous other problem. There were two main environmental problems in the West in the 1980s. One was acid rain, the other was the hole in the ozone layer, which came as a huge issue. Some scientists, in, some Mexican and American scientists discovered it. British scientists tell, told us this was enormous, and it was all over the media, totally dominating issue. Then we came together, global, and resolved the problem. And now the ozone layer is coming back. Uh, latest figure from scientists is that by 2050 it will be fully restored and it's rapidly coming back to its former shape. And we have saved 2 million cases of skin cancer every year just by bringing uh, the ozone layer back, back in place. 2 million. Most people with severe skin ca cancer still die. It's one of the most aggressive forms of cancer. So it is it at the very minimum hundreds of thousands of very happy husbands and wives. Uh, who have uh, not seen that their ones uh, die. Okay, <coughs> so we have solved these major in environmental issues. And by the way, salmon is now back in all the rivers in southern Norway, uh, where I live. Uh, it, it is back? It's back. It's back. In the past, we had, we had salmon in the rivers in northern Norway because they, they were not affected of the acid rain in, in, in Europe and in southern Norway. 
that for 100 years since the Industrial Revolution, we had no salmon in the rivers in southern Norway. Now it's all back. Please come and enjoy. Uh, <laughs> maybe more beautiful in the north, but still the rivers in southern Norway is not that bad. And you can get a, a big fat salmon, salmon there. Salmon you buy in the shops are from fish farming, nearly all of them. So the uh, salmon from the rivers is still a, a, still a catch. Okay, uh, and in reality is that the situation in, in nature in Norway is now better than at any point since before the Industrial Revolution happened because of these measures, uh, measures taken. And I think there are three, I mean, that, that's of course my main point here. Why, why, this ha why did this happen? How can we could we resolve the ozone issue or the uh, acid rain issue? I think there were three main elements which we basically need to emulate on everyone, everything we want to need, want to do. Number one, we need a strong public opinion, strong citizens' movement. Second, we need brave politicians, political leaders who regulate markets. And third, we need to use the power of the market, the power of business, to find the technical solutions to problems. Let's look into all these one by one, starting with citizens' movements. Unless you really mobilize citizens, it's very hard to resolve any environment or for that matter, any other political problem. You need to bring people behind you. You need a strong pressure from, from citizens on po pol pol political leaders and business. And if you want that to happen, you must engage on issues which people f have an interest in, and you must speak a language which people can understand. And we are basically, in my view, failing on both these, and we are failing when Let's put up a big mirror for the global environmental movement, because we are neutral to politics. Uh, but still, I cannot, uh, cannot avoid thinking of the fact that there was no discussion of environment issues at the kitchen tables of Kansas or Missouri uh, during the election campaign in the United States. If uh, environment had been discussed extensively in Michigan uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Florida, uh, the outcome of the election may have been a different one. Uh, leave that aside, under all circumstances, the environment was not discussed. That's our failure. If we cannot bring up environment issues in such a way that people take an interest, we are failing. The environmentalists are failing. And I think we are failing in two main, issue, two main areas. Number one, we must focus on the environment issues which are close to people, which people feel they can comprehend, we speak to the gut and to the heart, not just to half of the brain. That is, for instance, in Asia, pollution. Last week, Delhi was all about pollution. The city was closed down, schools were closed. We were, you were only able to go every second day with your car. It was a totally overriding issue in Indian politics last week. Yesterday, it was the same in Tehran and Iran. And of course, in nearly all Asian cities, the middle class is heavily affected by pollution. It's a huge issue and putting pressure on political leaders to act. And it's much, much easier to get people excited about resolving pollution than the somewhat more distant issue of climate change. The beauty, beauty is, of course, that nearly everything you want to do uh, for, uh, to curb climate change and nearly everything you want to do to co curb local pollution is the same. So maybe not the right environment phrase, but you can kill two birds with one stone if you bring these two issues together. And pollution is near to people, and exactly as people in Western Europe and the United States demanded politicians to act against the acid rain, I'm absolutely confident that the broad emerging middle class in Asia will force politicians in every nation to act on, uh, on uh, air pollution and other sorts of pollution here. But we can, of course, bring pollution much higher on the global uh, agenda, speak about it more passionately, uh, organize campaigns, uh, and, and in a way put it much more central on the agenda. And it deserves to be there. Because as much as we've been successful in bringing down all the transmittable diseases that all come down, yellow fever, polio, malaria, uh, smallpox, that either, either are they completely eradicated or they come enormously down. As much as that happens, the more pollution is coming up at the top of the agenda. Seven million people are dying prematurely, according to the World Health Organization, because of, of pollution. And by the way, you know what is the main killer of young people in the world now? Those between 15 and 30? AIDS, wars, Malaria, no, it's road accidents. That's the number one killer of those globally of those between 15 and 30. 
course, he speaks loudly about the need to be for better traffic reg regulation. It also tells us how successful we have been on the traditional killers of humanity, like, like the malaria and the, and the smallpox. Okay, so since pollution is coming up as a new global um, issue, we have the op opportunity to engage with people in a completely new way, and it's much closer to people. But we also need to speak another language. A uh, lot of the language we speak in the United Nations cannot be understood by everyone, by anyone. I have given the test to everyone in the United UN environment. That's also why we are changing from UNEP to UN environment to speak in, in a way people can understand. Put to your test if your mother understands what you say now, or for that matter, your father. My mother is 92 years old. Uh, she's very intelligent, following news, taking a lot of interest in politics, but because she cannot read any of the documents I get, or at least very few of them. And I can't even read many of the documents I, I, I get. I simply don't understand what it's all about, because there are so many acronyms, so many technical expressions that no normal person can understand. We are speaking, for instance, constantly about, as an example, the GCF, meaning the Green Climate Fund. I doubt that there is, en I doubt that there is one prime minister in the entire world who understands what GCF is. Maybe the Koreans, since it's located there. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I was in Brussels the other day, and the people in the Commission, European Commission, spoke about the CBD COP. They asked me, how can we make people very enthusiastic about the CBD COP? So, of course, you all know that is the meeting in Cancun, Mexico, next week about the biodiversity, the beauty of the planet, and how we can protect the different species on, on this planet. I told them, in my nation, Norway, probably there is not one member of parliament, nor what, one member of the government to understand what CBD COP means. Maybe my very, very good friend, the environment minister, does, but for sure he's the, the only candidate for that knowledge. And when we con continue to run around speaking like that, ho how can we get people enthusiastic? If you alienate people to speak in a way where they really feel that you're speaking above their heads, they tend to be angry against you. We must change. And the UN must change, and this is a big sickness uh, of the UN. I've demanded changes in all levels in the UN environment. We have changed all the names of the divisions, and we'll change the way we speak. Otherwise, we cannot engage with people. So, this is number one, citizens movement and in demand changes in language and in demand that we speak about issues which people care, care about. Second is a call, uh, of course, about political leadership. All the major changes we have seen in Asia can be put down to a few individuals. Starting with the major revolution or major restoration in Japan in the li late 1990s, uh, late uh, 18. Uh, uh, 1900, I mean the late 1800s, was a few individuals taking power and transforming Japan. You move on to Korea, to Singapore, to China, it's about political leadership. I mean, if the Gang of Four still have been in power in China, China will still have remained extra incredibly poor. The time when Deng Xiaoping came to power, China was at the level much poorer than most parts of Africa. Now you know the difference. When Lee Kuan Yew came to power in Singapore in the early 1960s, GDP per capita in Singapore was 500 American dollars. When Lee Kuan Yew last year left for God, uh, Lee, uh, GDP in Singapore was at the level of Switzerland and Luxembourg, competing about, dep depending on the definition, being the richest nations on the planet. All about leadership. And of course, we, as the international community, we cannot elect the leaders of any, any nation, but we must focus on the issue of political leadership, political leaders framing the market, mobilizing the forces of the market, providing leadership, providing a vision, and we must support any nation who can uh, come up with that. And that's the, that's the driving force. There are very, very big limits to what the international community can do if there is no leadership no proper leadership in, 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 an, in a nation. But whenever we see that emerging, let's do our utmost to provide the resources, technology, knowledge, finances, which leaders can bring uh, their way. Of course, exactly the same applies to the environment. One really beautiful moment in my career was being in Jakarta with then President SPY, uh, Yodiono where he had brought together the entire community there. All the ambassadors were there, his government w was there, uh, the civil society were there, and I, I told you earlier today, when he gave this pledge, he said, I promised my granddaughter, I will save the forest of Indonesia. It was so beautiful. 
And of course, just that from one man does not resolve all problems, but it set a complete new tone for Indonesia, which we see now reflected in business, in civil society, in basically every act. And I'm absolutely confident that in the years to come, we'll see the enormous shift uh, of protection of the peatlands and the forest of Indonesia and uh, transforming economies into using the land which is already, already degraded. So leadership is absolutely, absolutely key. Then finally, so of course, about business. Uh, the environment markets are different from nearly all other markets. I mean, you don't, know, don't, don't really need to regulate markets to get, say, Samsung or Apple to provide us with new uh, cellular phones. But if you want environment markets, they must be regulated. When we resolved the issue of acid rain, it was by politicians setting targets for business as to how they should move and then business making all the inno innovations and all the, all the products which we needed to uh, resolve it. Same with the Montreal Protocol. I mean, business have resolved, found the chemicals which could replace the old-fashioned chemicals in the refrigerators and air conditioning systems. And when we made the Kigali Agreement last month, which will drive this also in a climate-friendly fashion, again, business will res resolve that. And any environment issue which we have resolved has mainly been government setting targets, markets, deadlines, and then business finding the, the practical solutions. And that's exactly what we need to do on climate, and of course, to a large extent also on, on bio, biodiversity, to leave it to business to find the ways, but within regulated markets. The more we can regulate globally, of course, the better, but even if we cannot, if, if big markets like China or the United States or the European Union, or for that matter, Indonesia or India, are regulated, has enormous impact, and there's also a lot which can be done in smaller nations regulating their, regulating their, their markets. When in Norway in the early 1990s we got attacks on CO2, it was seen as very, very detrimental. I mean, business at all is very, very dangerous. Now everyone are, are quarreling. I, whether I was the father or mother of this uh, initiative, the two main political parties started quarreling. The female leader of one party said that I'm the mother, uh, and the male leader of the other said that I'm, I'm the father of that initiative. At the time, it was very controversial. Of uh, course, it has sold us so well. It has been a way to get new products into the, to the market and being in kind of in, uh, in advanced in the industrial uh, world. Same with the cleanup of the big rivers of, of Europe, say the Thames or the Seine or the, uh, or the, or the Rhine, They're much, much cleaner now. Some of them are so clean that you can easily drink the water straight from, straight from the river, while a few decades back they were absolutely unclean and hor horribly uh, polluted. And it has, produ has produced, of course, a business opportunity rather than the problem. And we have contributed to the bad language here, speaking so often about climate and environment as a cost rather than as a fantastic business opportunity. Any number of new green jobs to be provided. And of course, if you have this cost aspect, it's very hard for a, uh, for a developing nation to embrace. Because you, if it's a cost to go into environment, civil society, media, politicians will say, oh, no, no, that we can only do when we have become so affluent, uh, like the Europeans or the Americans, then we can go into uh, environment-friendly politics. If it's seen as a business opportunity, something you do now for your business to develop fast and as a competitive uh, issue, they're much more likely to succeed. And I'm absolutely sure the reason why we could make the Kigali Agreement one month back in, in Rwanda was because Chinese and many other businesses said this is an opportunity for us to provide the right products and remind yourself what happened in the United States after the Kigali Agreement. The negotiator came back home made that deal, everyone was happy, except, of course, some Republicans in the Senate who said, oh, no, 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 have you uh, consulted us for this deal? We will not accept. Well, then immediately American business stood up and said, but we are firmly behind this deal. This deal serves American enterprise interest. We will provide jobs on these basis. Please, you politicians, don't mess it up for us. Uh, on that basis, it's very hard to see uh, that this will be a kind of turnaround in the United States as long as business is so firmly, firmly uh, be behind it. Le let's see. But again, business is now uh, so critical to whatever we need to do, and we need to embrace business in a completely new way. 
United Nations have been very reluctant to business, very long. Still, you find a number of diplomats running around the world speaking negatively about the uh, private sector. I've never met, I've, in all my years doing development and environment, there's one conversation I've never had. I've never met a prime minister or a president or a minister of finance who said, please, please don't come with your investment. Please only come with your aid. Uh, but what's interesting is that if you go to New York, to the diplomats there, quite often you get that perspective that aid is much better than investment. Or in the climate talks, I also very often heard the argument, oh, no, no, it's much better with aid. Let's not mess, mess it up with, with investment or with private sector. But every political leader in the world is really desiring investment. Most leaders in the developing world will tell you we want both aid and investment. But nearly all of them will say, if you have the choice, we prefer investment. That serves us better. But we may need aid to make investment more likely. We may we need aid for education, which cannot easily be funded by, by, by investment. We may we want a combination. But the desire is really for the investment. So let's not mess this up with, with the wrong, bring wrong politics. And we must go out and really un underline this um, gospel private sector and private investment is the right thing to do. When Burundi and Madagascar is very poor, it's not because of over-exploitation by business, simply they are exactly the opposite, that there is no real business strategy for these uh, nations. There is lack of investment, not too much investment, which is the problem. That's exactly the same when it comes to environment. If no profit can be made, it's much less likely that something is happening. Then, of course, there is a kind of system failure of capitalism, because wh what we really want to see is, of course, green capitalism. It's not government-sponsored programs, but capitalism to turn into green and turn into inclusive. The working method of capitalism must change. True, there are differences between, say, American and Chinese capitalism, but by and large, we have only one working global economic system, and again, that's called capitalism. That must turn green. Then we need stock exchanges to be regulated, and then central banks to regulate. We need government to regulate those markets, but we must, must drive it in that direction. And there is one systematic problem. That is, profits for destroying the nature is nearly always privatized, while costs of destroying nature is nearly always socialized. Meaning that if I destroy a forest, I, can, I and my company can profit from it. The cost will be taken by the taxpayers, or by next generation, or by the global community, but for sure by someone else. That must change. That's why we need to put the cost square and open. If you destroy the nature, you pay the cost. It's not easy, but that's, that's what we need. That's the change we, we need to, to have. And if companies are highly exposed to climate damage or to environment damage, dust must be reported, it must be part of the fact sheet, it must be part of the reporting to stock exchanges so that everyone can see it, because that will drive change. Every company of any stature in the world need to report economic performance. If they want to be at the stock exchange or if they want to be a major player, they report all the economic re performance. They need to start reporting about the environment performance so that we can scrutinize it and we can name and shame those who do poorly, name and fame those who do well, and drive, drive, drive change. And investors can avoid putting their money unfairly into a company which is heavily exposed to climate risk, which is not visible in the present, present system. So finally, uh, there are a number of environmental issues in the world, but the two main ones, are, which are very obvious candidates for close cooperation between the Asian Development Bank and UN Environment, one is climate and pollution, which we should try to bring together. The other is biodiversity and the protection of nature and climate, which we should also try to bring together. Because our resources are limited. So the more we can fight local pollution and climate change with the same me methods, the same money, the same regulations, and the more we can protect nature and avoid climate change, again, with the same money and the same the same uh, measures, the more successful we will be. And we have any number of good practice to show for us, and we can do a lot more of that. 
just mentioned that we have just launched in Jakarta an initiative called Globe, uh, Tropical Landscapes Investment Facility, which is about bringing money to protect the forest of Indonesia, the uh, peatlands of Indonesia. That will demand, demand government intervention because unless the government regulate, unless the government says there will be no transformation and destruction of the peatlands, it will still continue to happen. But the government will not be able to do that unless there is also something in it for the smallholder farmers who are the people destroying the forest. They must simply get a livelihood or an alternative, otherwise it will be very difficult for the government to make the, the kind of the strong measures needed. But the combination of strong government and uh, this economic facility where uh, Asian Development Bank can provide similar uh, support, that is what will, will drive, uh, the, uh, drive the change. But to come back to the starting point, let's get out of this completely unnecessary negative uh, view of the world. I know it's more of that in the United States and in Europe than there is in Asia, because Asia is dry moving so uh, fast in the right direction. But please bring the Asian perspective to the rest of the world. Asia is more than 50% of humanity. It's rapidly economically growing. It's rapidly stepping up to the environment challenge. And it's by and large and peace. That's exactly what we need uh, and at the planet uh, 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 overall. And you can be the lead, you mini Asia can be the lead, lead part of this in the years to come, and you will be. Thank you. And thanks for that very encouraging and positive message, drawing on the experience of addressing intractable uh, environmental issues as they seemed, whether it was acid rain or the ozone layer hole, which we finally closed, which is a tremendous success. Mm -hmm. And you pointed out these, these three key factors, is, is public engagement to drive political will. You uh, spoke about the role of government to create the enabling environment to drive the private sector. <laughs> and you spoke about the role of the private sector to drive innovation and finance and move towards this model of green capitalism, as you called it, uh, which is really the green economy, green growth, and, and uh, um, what we are all seeking to achieve in Asia and the world. And certainly UNEP and ADB can be close partners here. Uh, we have a, a long-standing MOU, which we have recently uh, reaffirmed, and in discussions with management, we discussed how we can work together on climate change, on, on biodiversity, on air pollution. As you rightly point out, addressing the most immediate local environmental issues is sometimes the, the, the right entry point for addressing the more global issues, which can sometimes seem more distant and removed from everyday lives. And it really is a continuum from the local to the global. And the solutions, as you pointed out, are often the same. So there's a sort of co-benefit and a double dividend. But let's um, just... I think you don't need an intermediary here, really. And you wanted to have a conversation. I think, I think you should find some okay, I'll do that. If some people are very quarrelsome, you can avoid them. True, I, that's right. I know the, the more dangerous people and, and the, the more polite ones, so we can focus on Those that. who <laughs> ask very, very nice and polite <laughs> questions, so you can give preference to them, yeah. All right, if you wish. But I, 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 I suspect you like to have the tough questions, too. Um, so the, op the, the floor is open for... Any questions, comments, suggestions? Yes, Edie. Yours. Um, I do agree with you that we need to start talking to uh, public um, as if, uh, you know, they, and they do, uh, they do understand the issues that are facing us, but um, we should stop using acronyms and start having a conversation with them. Uh, what would you suggest to us as uh, leaders at ADB or, or the political leaders? How do we start this conversation? When I was a young aspiring politician in Norway, I did run around with a lot of Marxist phrases. And then I, then I met an old trade unionist and he said, Please, Eric, understand that the consciousness of the working class is always concrete. Uh, and I come to the conclusion later in life that that's reality of nearly all human beings. People are concrete, 
they're looking for what does this concretely mean. And that's why I'm so adamant to work on pollution, because that's concrete here and now. If you are a mother in Delhi or Tehran or Beijing or Shanghai, you feel it and you are afraid of your children getting asthma. You don't, you d I mean, you are very happy with economic development in China, but you really want this to go away so that you can see the sun, so that your children can have a, a, a better life. When it comes to nature, a lot of the same. The concept of biodiversity, I mean, it's very, very nice and exactly the right thing, but people are much more enthusiastic if you speak about the orangutan or the elephant uh, or the beautiful flowers or the beauty of nature or maybe the religious roots of this because people's love for nature in many, many, for many, many people come out of their religious belief. They believe this is the right thing to do as a Buddhist or a Christian or whatever it may, whatever it may be, simply to speak about issues in a much, much more concrete near uh, terms in another language than you but conversation is of course the key because as long as you have a conversation and you get a uh, reply, you are more likely to get the language right also. Right. And um, it, it is really uh, truly awe-inspiring that you're single-handedly taking on the bureaucraties within the UN system. And we all wish you a lot of luck in, <laughs> in solving that and, and we can certainly use some help ourselves. Um, any, please. Microphone, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Idris Suleiman. I'm from the Indonesian Green Building Council. I uh, really appreciate that you mentioned Indonesia in the context of the um, natural environment. Uh, but uh, you said also that we need to come up with difficult questions. Um, Last year, 2015, was one of the most devastating um, year when it comes to forest fires. But um, this year, Indonesia has witnessed a major, up, uh, kind of like, it's not a major, but it's, a, it's an, a symptom of something much deeper, demonstrations in urban areas. And that's maybe has a religious uh, versus non-religious uh, surface to it, but maybe underneath all of that, there's all these elements to do with the urban environment and um, the, the, the urban sprawl that people have to live with in bigger cities like Jakarta. And I think it's pretty really similar to Manila in many ways. So how is ADB and UNEP going to address this burgeoning urban problem where we know that most of the countries have more than majority in the, uh, in the urban areas. How can you inf get politicians to really address public housing, you know, standards of housing, standards of waste, and so on? I really like to know about that. Well, that that's obviously a really spot on uh, question, and uh, Asia is rapidly urbanizing which is, by the way, also Africa. Latin America is already the far, by far, most urbanized of all continents. 90% of all people in Argentina live in cities, 80% plus in Brazil. So we are, we are living in an extremely urbanized way. But most of the issues facing mayors are by large the same all over the planet. It's about city transport, how to curb car transport and provide mass transit systems. It's about waste management about water uh, management, and as you say, about public housing, or at least how to, how to make, m make housing. So what, what we need to see, see is a lot more of exchange of views, building upon the best examples. For instance, why don't people in Manila or in Jakarta ask, how come that China is able to construct 100 kilometers of metro in both Shanghai and Beijing every year? That's much longer than the entire metro system, I think, in Oslo. Every year, adding on in Shanghai and, and Beijing. It's not to say that there are not too many cars there still, but it's an enormous achievement. And it's not that Manila and Jakarta are so much poorer, because the Chinese did this, started doing this at a, at a, at a much earlier stage. So it's about how to organize society and make, make, make this happen. And I would suggest that question is, should be put up as a real, real, real conversation because obviously it's, it's possible to do it. 
And when it comes to all the other so-called uh, building codes, may sometimes make the immediate construction of house a little bit more expensive, not always, but it's nearly always m much more economic if, if you take a 10, or, or long, 10 years or longer, longer perspective because you simply get higher high, high quality housing. Uh, waste management and these kind of issues, the more they can, more private sector can be brought in, the more it can be seen as a business opportunity, the more waste can be seen as a resource, the more likely you are to succeed, rather than seeing it as a cost, a resource for, for what, you can, what, you can do, what you can do more. And we need to really clamp down on plastic in this world. I mean, we, some suggestions say that by 2050 we will have the combined weight of plastic in the global oceans is more than the combined weight of fish. And in fact, it is true unless, you, we, unless we change. So obviously we, we need to change. We cannot allow that to happen. Plastic is an enormous problem in many cities, at land as well as in sea, but the, the, there are solutions to it. The United Kingdom had just put a small levy on plastic bags. It dropped by 90%, more or less, from one day to the other. As an example, Rwanda, right center in Africa, is it's the cleanest city in Africa. Uh, why is that? Because there is a leader, like Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, who has made that a national pride to make the city clean like Singapore did from the very beginning, making it maybe the cleanest city on the, on the planet. So Lee Kuan Yew believed in it, now everyone agree. At the time, there were lots and lots of people saying, how is this cra crazy guy who don't even allow people to throw the chewing gum in the streets? And remind yourself that Singapore, at a very early stage, said that it's not inscribed in the Human Rights Declaration that you are allowed to freely bring your, sit your car to the city center. If you want to do that, you must pay, or you must make sure the car is full. Uh, that was vision at that time. Now, many, many, many cities are trying to do the same. So leadership is, is key, and uh, if you want an inspiring example, both on environment and development, Lee Kuan Yew is, uh, is it. I don't know that, may I know that it's not maybe the best selling principle in Indonesia to point to Singapore, <laughs> but still it's, still it is true. But these are some suggestions. Thank you very much. Any other points from the floor? Please. Good afternoon. Uh, Eric, before I ask my question, I'd like to have a quick question here in the room first. How many of you bike to work every day? All right, so few. All right, I'm doing, I'm Mary Ann. I'm working on a master's thesis, uh, which is about um, building elevated bike lanes for Metro Manila. In the initial um, study that I'm getting from the, from the survey, many people would want to bike or go to, to school uh, using their bicycle, but majority of them, about 90% of the respondents are saying they don't feel safe at all in Metro Manila roads. And I think that's one of the reasons why only two or three persons uh, raised their hands today. Now, I'm trying to convince people to help me um, do my analytical work because it's, it's really um, costing me a lot of my personal money. The, the thing is, many people um, whom I've approached is saying that it's going to be a very expensive project. And understandably, it is, it is true. Now, my question is, how can we make it um, possible to build expensive infrastructure like that by convincing people and investors that actually our, measure, our way of measuring our um, environmental or infrastructural projects is somehow very conservative. We always think about the money terms. We always think about in in dollar terms, which is also understandable, but I somehow feel that um, we, ho we also have to be more um, liberal-minded when, when measuring those um, projects, because how do we really measure, you know, spending more time with your loved ones or um, breathing uh, fresher air or, you know, um, doing more productive um, activities. So my, my question to you, Eric, is that how do we do that? How do we convince our policymakers, our investors, that they should invest more on infrastructures like this, balancing the, the, the way we are doing our environmental accounting with more um, social um, and um, you know uh, social and health, looking at the social and health uh, impacts, via v, you know the dollar sign. So please um, help me <laughs> convince our policymakers to, to build those bike lanes. 
mean, ob obviously it's an economic failure that what all economists would say is a market failure because there can hardly be any higher cost to a society than the, than the waste of human capital of millions of people sitting for hours in cars doing nothing, doing nothing. I mean, maybe listening to the, to the music, but except for that, doing nothing. No productivity, no love with the wife or the husband, no, no nothing. That's an enormous, enormous cost and should be seen in economic terms as a waste of the resources of the Philippine Republic or for that matter, any other, any other, other nation. And I think you need to build a kind of this economic case also added to the, to the environment and, and human, uh, human case. Uh, if you want good examples of cities where uh, bicycling is done, I would recommend Amsterdam and Copenhagen as two of the best examples. I mean, they have done it fantastically and people feel safe and they can travel by, 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 by um, bike everywhere. Added to that, it's also health benefit. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Strauss. I'm um, one of the, along with the Ambassador Danica, I represent the U.S. at the ADB. Um, I, first of all, I just want to say thank you for emphasizing the, uh, the progress that we've made in the world, uh, particularly in the environment, which I think is so important. And as you say, at a time like this, we really need to hear it. But you also asked for tough questions and, and uh, feeding off of the previous question. I think um, I, I, in, earlier in my career, I did a lot of work in environmental think tanks, environmental foundations, uh, emerging out of uh, my interest in environmental economics. And I found in that work that there were two different types of environmental problems. There were the ones that you can solve with win-win solutions, which everyone loves and make us all very optimistic. And then there are the ones that you can't, and they're the ones that involve trade-offs. And that second category, as, as you rightly alluded to, involves the internalization of externalities, to use phrases that our, our mothers wouldn't recognize. And the problem is, as you say, that the benefits go to the private sector uh, of, of non-internalized non externalities, and the uh, trade-offs, the, 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 the negative effects go to the public to be dealt with. Those are the hardest issues. Those are the ones where I'm not optimistic that just saying that business has a role to play, which is true, doesn't help the individuals who are suffering. Uh, so what, how do we attack that hard problem without focusing on all the win-wins? How do we uh, uh, pr pr approach the environmental problems that have trade-offs? Thanks. I think the, the deforestation is a clear example of that. I mean, there may be an initial may be benefit for the individual farmer or for the Palmer company in destroying the forest, obviously. Uh, some scientists uh, made a calculation of the global industries and they came to the conclusion that the most unproductive of all industries in the world is cattle farming in Latin America. They calculated that the cost of that for society is six times the profit which can be made by those who benefit. But of course, one farmer destroyed the forest to provide for his family, which is uh, what we all would have done if we didn't, didn't see the alternative. I think the way this has been handled now is very illustrative. Governments have acted. Uh, the Brazilian government has acted very decisively and very interestingly, even with this seismic shift in Brazilian politics now from the left to the right, this stands. Present government seems to be as committed as the previous to protect the Amazon. C simply become the part of the DNA. Not that there is not some people out there who, who, do, who doesn't, dis doesn't agree, that, that's the case, but on the government political le level, this is now national policy, which is very important. And then secondly, it's about mobilizing business. Uh, again, put pressure on the global companies who buy the products from the rainforest, typically the Nestle and the Unilevers. They, by the way, are now most, uh, among the most environmentally friendly companies on the planet, far, far ahead of governments when it comes to internal, uh, internalizing environment issues in the, in the business model. Very much far uh, beyond most, most governments. Uh, and, but of course, it's because the leaders there believe in it, but also because not all, but sub substantial amount of customers were worried with palm oil. So then understood that they need, if, the, if palm oil should be part of the products, they needed to change. But then taking up the same issue with the, with the Indonesian companies, uh, putting pressure on them, starting a dialogue with them, and convincing them that they could change, which they have all promised to do. Every single big palm oil, every single big paper and pulp company in Indonesia has made a zero deforestation pledge. From that, you still need to get it implemented everywhere, which will take time, but it's a huge, huge positive shift. 
So I think that shows that you can make a change even with, with some benefit, um, even if the, the, major, uh, the planet um, is destroyed uh, by attacking both politics and, and private sector. But at the end of the day, of course, for, for politicians to be able to act, you need also to look into how you can compensate those who uh, are not benefiting, which are the sm some of the small scale farmers, so you need an investment program in, with them. Which is, by the way, not different from when I was Minister of Environment in Norway, whenever we had a national park there, and it will be the same in the United States, we find systems for compensating those who were losing. The ben national parks were greatly beneficial for Norway as a nation, but still some people around in the park may lose. Well, we compensated them, and we had any number of dialogues with the local people, and my view was that the better, the longer the dialogue, the better, because if it was... So was the national park was soundly supported by the people in the neighborhood. It has a much better platform for the future than if it was implemented just from above. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Mayo Villalus. I'm from the World Bank, working in the East Pacific um, region. My, my, um, I was happy to hear from you that you mentioned about using investment financing to promote green growth, as well as to find concrete ways and means to be able to you know, include all sectors of society. Uh, my question is, what is the next steps that the UN system is doing to better promote natural capital accounting so that we're able to measure physical assets and you know, monetary values, as well as push government to report on a green GDP? I think this is the way forward. But you know, we have to have more people involved, more governments involved, and I guess more funds <laughs> for this. Thank you. I think there is no magic formula, but we need to push ahead and engage with governments. But from the UN system, particularly, we need to engage a lot more with business. Because at the end of the day, regulating business works best if it's through a dialogue with business, because the reg you want regulation which drives you in the right direction. And very often, thank pol policymakers are not really uh, as knowledgeable as they should be. I can give you one example from my own, own country. When we, we, had a, we had a huge backlog when I was Minister of Environment in Norway on NOx. Uh, and the Minister of Finance said the only, there is only one way to solve that in accordance with economic theory. There must be a price uh, on, on NOx. Then the business said, no, 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 no that, that won't work. Uh, after some dialogue with business, we found a different system uh, where we put a price on some of this, but we also used that money to support the businesses who changed. Uh, and the end result was the same reduction as the Minister of Finance had uh, suggested, but with much, much less tension and, and problems, and with the happy business, which basically thought that we are now also moving into industrial products, which at the end of the day we can, we can, we can market and, be and benefit from. So I think uh, while I, at the end of the day, there is no way you can resolve environment problems without firm decisions by government, and without regulating markets, but market regulation works best if it's in a very good dialogue with, with the same business as you, as you want to regulate. Any other? We step up both nationally and, and globally on this. Lots of questions, but uh, one organization which has been very active uh, with respect to certification, roundtable, and uh, various uh, forestry and other type of uh, stewardship councils like uh, fishery stewardship councils and all of that has been WWF, uh, working with the private sector. And uh, it's basically started about uh, 10 years ago and in the last five, six years we've been seeing a momentum in terms of certification for a number of products, a number of commodities. And there's been an increase which is in many ways is highly promising in what you are basically saying in terms of greening the supply chain. Uh, do you think that UNEP uh, uh, has got uh, a space to play in that area? I mean, I, mean, I just mentioned WWF because it came to my mind and we have an MOU also with them, but what kind of uh, engagement you see uh, for UNEP to work with the private sector? In, in, in what ways do you think is most directly effective? Because WWF came from a private sector background. I mean, some of the people who founded the WWF initially were business people, and of course, they were rich people. There were some royals, and it was a very different background. 
And I <coughs> asked a very interesting question. I mean, you may know the answer. Wh why they selected the panda as the symbol? You know that? I mean, panda is probably the most well-known global symbol uh, of environmentalism. I mean, it's a very, very, very rare animal living in a few bamboo forests of Sichuan province of China. How would you select exactly that bear to be the global symbol? It is because <coughs> at the time you had only black and white TV and black and white photography, and there is no better animal in black and white <laughs> than, than, the, than the pandas because it's all black, black and white. <coughs> so, but it shows that these people were from a very different background than some of the people in the UN who are uh, good statesmen, uh, uh, but maybe not as innovative as, as that. We, we need to change. I mean, what we need is, of course, the, the knowledge, the outreach of the private sector, the money, the investment, the technology. What they need from the UN is, I think, by and large, our ability to convene in power, to bring people together, it's much of the same as with you. Uh, they want to stamp uh, that this is the right thing to do, which is a kind of recognition of their efforts. They want us to name and fame those who do well so that they can uh, benefit fr from that. So there is a number of assets also we can provide in that, that dialogue with the private sector. And of course, in many areas, private sector find it very, very useful if you can find global standards, either mandatory standards for everyone or at least standards for what is best practice, which they can try to uh, try to achieve. So that, that's, I think, the kind of trade-off we can do. We can benefit from them. They can benefit from us. Let me just mention as an example, since we are in Asia, <coughs> I was in uh, the, the first, and there is, there is a lot, 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 lot of people are skeptical to, the to working with the private sector. Um, and I think, think the main, the main Re, uh, main way of getting out of that problem is two, we need to be completely transparent. I mean, whatever we do should be open to everyone. Uh, and the second, <coughs> the second uh, is uh, we need to make sure it's a global affair because up to now, nearly all agreements between the UN and private sector has been with European or American companies. So the first deal I was uh, made was with a Chinese company called Ants Finances. Ants mean the small animal. It's a huge company, it's not small. They have 450 million customers by cellular phone. It's the biggest, uh, it's the biggest um, fintech company in the world. Uh, they are related to the Alibaba group. Uh, <coughs> and probably the outreach of Ants with the 450 million customers is bigger than any other uh, entity in the world, except the Chinese leadership itself. Uh, and they have an, uh, they have an, uh, this will be my last, they have an uh, environment conversation with the people where we can have a, com we can have a competition, who's the most environment friendly of us. Well, if you go by bicycle to your job today, you get points. If I buy the newest refrigerator with the best technology, I get points. Then uh, ver uh, very soon on, on your mobile phone, you get a tree. Then that tree is immediately transformed into a physical tree in, in the Mongolia, the driest place in, in, in China. You can go and you get the GPS coordinate for the Eric tree, which is in, in the Mongolia. I can go and embrace my Eric tree. I can kiss it. <laughs> I can see it. And if I'm very environment friendly, I can get my small little forest in, in the Mongolia. Where I make this example is of course that the outreach of ants is much, much, much bigger than any civil society organization in the entire world, the most governments to speak about the UN. So if they can promo promo promote environment entertainment, call it that, or environment, enter uh, environment education to the people, it has an enormous potential. So reaching out to the private sector is not just about getting them to fund their programs, but it's the enormous outreach and technology and knowledge of the private sector. And and this is a prime example. And I'm <coughs> ready to take any criticism from old-fashioned guys who don't want to work with the private sector. That's <laughs> uh, Joel Palmer just arrived, president of WWF. And you missed, Joel. We, we found out about your panda and, and why WWF <laughs> chose it. Um, welcome. Trevor? 
on the private sector, uh, actually you answered the question I wanted to ask you about Ant. I wanted to know what your plans were for it because it's a really interesting joint venture or a, a, a agreement that you have with them. But also in the private sector, not only the uh, Ant you know, kind of a metaphor, but all of us have our own investment plans of our own and we have our own pension funds. And I'd like to know if uh, United Nations uh, UN environment is able to really point to great examples of money managers, the intermediaries between what we think is somewhat of a powerless position that we have with our investments. We all seek to have a return. We all want to pay for our children's tuition or our lives or our retirement. But there is ultimately some decisions to be made where people can really walk the walk and not just talk. And I was wondering, where have you seen great examples? And you're joining this organization. Where are you seeing great examples in terms of capital movements, capital management, that speak to the green principles, whether that's pension funds or, more importantly, I think, uh, third-party uh, money managers, so that private sector element uh, that is making investments that you know, UN Environment really wants to you know, point to or at least be aware of in terms of demonstrating really great principles for, for passive investment, at least. Maybe people here with better knowledge of this than I do have, but I can offer my own country as an example. Uh, the biggest Norwegian private insurance company, Storbrand, is well ahead of the sovereign wealth fund when it comes to the principle it's applied to its investment. Of course, it's taking a forward-leaning position and not, not uh, trying to avoid the bad and look into how they can move the money into the, into the, into the good. And a number of also pension funds in Europe, I mean in Denmark, in the Netherlands, have also taken decisions to move their capital in, 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 in a positive direction. But of course we need for this to happen a lot more, and then disclosure is one tool. We need government regulations of this. Uh, and of course ma man many, of the <coughs> many of the big investors claim, <laughs> rightly or wrongly, that some of the restrictions they have got after the after the financial crisis, make it more difficult for them to take take the risk they they, they want want to do. So these are issues we need to need to need to look into. Uh, you've mentioned the regulation quite a lot today. Uh, I, I agree, but in my country, the UK, there's about five men who don't like regulation, and they also happen to own about seventy to eighty percent of the print news media. Um, so my question to you is. Uh, how, how can we advance these agendas when there's such a big stumbling block uh, between you know, well, communicating with the, with the people to get them on side? No, that, that's for sure uh, uh, a very important issue. Uh, however, uh, when there is strong, strong uh, political movement in society which we need to uh, bring about, uh, it is always able to overrun media. So media is important, uh, uh, but it's not all. I mean, you cannot, <coughs> and but you have a particular, very particular media situation in the UK for sure. Thank you very much, Eric, for that uh, brilliant uh, speech that gives us hope to, to think about green capitalism and how ADB and uh, UNEP can work together in the region to address issues of air pollution, biodiversity, and climate change. Before we close this session, though, um, we have a particular ceremony for our eminent speakers for us, and that is we'd like to offer you a token of our appreciation, which is probably a nightmare for putting in your suitcase and, and taking back to Nairobi. But uh, thank you very much. We really enjoyed this event, and I think everyone here had a, a very useful and productive discussion. So thank you very much. <laughs>